Here we are again, brothers and sisters in Christ. We welcome you during this second, second week of the Easter season as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And under the watchful eye of Dr. Luther, we hear the word together. It can be very depressing, demoralizing. It can be discouraging to continue to listen to the news and all of the the bitterness and the oneriness of the news going on and, and everything. So it's a good thing for us to turn that sound, the noise down and, and use this time to grow together in the grace and knowledge of Christ and study God's word. I wish we could do it together. I long for the day we can do it together again, but here we are and may God bless it. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We pray, blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, th this week we're going to go through Acts chapter 5. I encourage you to turn off the noise and whatever screens and everything and maybe to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 5, and we'll study the Word together. I know that my man Martin is watching today, so a little shout out to you, Martin. I'm going to let you have a front row seat here, and uh, you can inspire us to in our study of the word there. I'm going to put Martin up. So on one side, and I know somebody else that that you've all been wanting to see and get a chance to talk to lately is Mr. Schlocky. Yes, me too. So let's put Mr. Schlocky up there. They should be in our, there, can join us for our Bible study today. I know that they're both watching, so uh, they'll enjoy this time together. Now, Acts chapter 4, you know, after the resurrection of Christ in the book of Acts, the beginning of Acts, it sets the framework for it. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. He'll come upon you and you'll preach the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. So it shows the expansion of the church after Christ ascends into heaven and, and commissions his disciples to go and preach. Well, that's that's... At first, in the opening part of, of the book of Acts, it's in Jerusalem that that's taken place. And you come to the end of chapter 4, and you notice something very, uh, it's kind of amazing and beautiful, and it shows the, that their understanding of a Christians, of the bonds that we ought have toward one another, and the love that bound the church of Christ together, to the point that they were living in a, a communal kind of setting, to where in the book of, of chapter 4, if you look at the end of chapter 4, people were selling their possessions and bringing them and laying it to the at the feet of the disciples. And the apostles were the ones that were distributing those things. And that's how we meet Barnabas at the end of chapter 4. And he's going to become pivotal for the, the second half of the book because he's going to go out with Paul and be one of the great uh, missionaries, the apostles, to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. So in, in chapter 4, they're selling fields, come, laying it at the feet of the disciples, and it's being dispersed. That's why we come to this strange event in, in Acts chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira, well, we'll read it here in a second. Um, this was actually our e first lesson from last week, except it was the second half of that, and we will get there, hopefully, to that part of it, too. So there is no, we, we must say that there is no scriptural mandate that you can't have private property in scripture. And and we begin to see already here in chapter five that this practice of, A, it wouldn't last very long, right? If everybody just, it shows how much they were expecting the coming of Christ at any moment, that they were selling everything they had and then, then meeting one another's needs. Because pretty soon they're all going to realize we have to go out and get jobs and work because Christ's coming. We don't, it could be at any moment. And that's still true today. It could be any moment, but we don't know the day or the hour. So we've got to continue to labor and, and serve. 
So in chapter five, we're going to see that that kind of communal approach has its own problems, right? We know socialism's a miserable failure everywhere it's tried. It is just because it doesn't account for the reality of the selfish sinfulness of mankind. Well, you're going to see that with Ananias and Sapphira. In chapter six, you're going to see it when the 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 Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians, their widows were they were fighting against one another for the their share of the food and the distribution of the food. So that's always involved its own problems. What I'd say is we don't use these verses. So don't God commands us to love one another and meet the needs of one another. But I wouldn't suggest that that the model of being a true Christian community is that we must uh, vote for a socialistic style of of government and still worse, a communistic style of government. That is to say that nobody shares anything in, in that everybody has to share everything in common. Well, it's going to fail here. And, and that's because of that sinful nature that's at work in us. We ought to renounce that and, and mutually meet one another's burdens and bear one another's burdens. But God does give us the right to have what is ours, and so much so that he safeguards it with a commandment. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. So I can't steal from you to meet whatever social agenda I have. Still less can I vote for somebody that will steal from you, because it's the same thing. Rather, I ought to be content for my neighbor and work and, and give selflessly from my own resources and yes work for good in the broader culture too and and for the service of our neighbor but it's always easy to be generous with somebody else's money and that's where all the problems come in because then you get into crazy situations where where uh, you're electing government to steal from one portion and what have you acrimony it's no good has ever come out of it in chapter 5, you'll see a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So this was his. Ananias and Sapphira had a property that presumably was their property legally, and they could do with it as they wished. Here, they're selling it and then representing to Peter, who is the leader of the apostles there, at least in the early going here in the book of Acts, representing to, to him and the Christian community there in Jerusalem that they've somehow given it all when they haven't, right? When they hadn't, it was within their right to withhold it or a portion of it or any portion of it. But they're saying, oh, we gave it all. Look how good we are. Right? And it's always, a lot of times, unfortunately, people use their giving and their generosity to pat themselves on the back and as a way to accrue power, right? It's a kind of a politician's thing is I want to accrue power to myself by being generous with something that belongs to somebody else and what have you. So here we are, man. So he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So first of all, I'd note there that the devil is always the author of deceit and lies, and that's still true for us. Satan was, Jesus said in John 8, a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He plants in our hearts to, to contrive lies and deceits. And boy, how easy it is for us to, to do a little tweaking to the truth so that we look a little better than we should. Or if we get in trouble, as they want, they're each going to get in trouble here. Instead of backing off and confessing the truth, oh no, you know, we pile lie upon lie to make ourselves look good, and and that's the devil in us that that always wants us to resist repentance. That's what's so damaging sometimes is is 
is we have people that line up to help us to to spread the lie and defend us when when the better situation is always to come clean before God in repentance and to have that sin washed away. But notice there in verse four, he says, Peter says, you've not lied to men, but to God. Right? You've not lied to men, but to God. And specifically, he says, Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. So this is a very important verse to, to prove that the Holy Spirit is, and Scripture regards the Holy Spirit, as God. Right? He's not just, it's not just the Spirit or kind of a force or an energy that comes from God. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit... Uh, was there in the beginning. In the, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters in chapter 1. The Holy Spirit's the one who creates faith. He creates a new heart in us. In Psalm 51, renew the, a right spirit within me. Take not, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit in Titus 3, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. These are works of God. The Holy Spirit is God. Where can I flee from your spirit? The psalmist says in Psalm 139, the Holy Spirit is, is ever present. So the Holy Spirit is therefore God. You can look at this. I encourage you to get out your catechism and it has a great section in there about the Holy Spirit and the biblical proofs that the Holy Spirit is God. Peter says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You didn't lie to men, you lied to God, because the Holy Spirit's God, okay? Verse five, when, it, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and a great fear came upon all who heard it. Always wondered, man, Peter is so harsh there. At first, it's not, there's, it's not Peter's judgment that's being handed down. It's the it's the divine judgment of God. But after Peter saw Ananias die, you almost wish he wouldn't have called Sapphira in to talk the situation over at all. But there it is. He lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter pronounced, you lied, and he fell down and died. And it's, for us, we're always kind of in that position where we want to justify how God works. We don't want to Oh, it's, that sounds like such a harsh picture of God because we like the teddy bear picture of God, right? But whether it's coronavirus or Chinese virus or whatever, wherever, whatever the situation is, God has our lives in his hands. And when we live or die, we do so to the Lord. <laughs> All of our days are marked out for us. God knows before one of them comes to be. And if in his judgment, Ananias in his sin against God, dies, he dies. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now you can whine about that all you want, but the path of wisdom, I think, for us is to say, is, is repentance. Dear God, forgive me, and to run to the cross, because God has also prepared in Christ our resurrection. He's prepared the salvation for us because his son went down into death for us. So this is tough. Ananias falls down and dies. But, and this is the stuff we never know, and we pray God's doing this now with the whole Chinese virus stuff, is we hope God's using this to create faith, to bring this wandering world back to repentance. So many as will come to repentance and be saved, that they hear the gospel through the church, maybe through the word that's being preached right now, don't harden your hearts. Don't think it's all about your money and restoring your stock, futures, accounts, and whatever. Repent, return to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Okay, so here Ananias dies, but a great fear comes upon the whole community, and that doesn't drive him away from Christ. It's kind of like the mountain climber who is afraid of the mountain, but he's so drawn to it, he continues to climb the mountain. He is, he's fearful in a respectful way. You know, I know this can kill me, but he loves it and he's drawn to it. Well, the church grew after this thing with Ananias, after he's, after he's put to death for his disobedience there. Well, anyway, the young men, they rose, they wrapped Ananias up and carried him out and buried him. They didn't wait for his wife to, to do the, and, and for the regular Jewish kind of burial ceremonies, they carried him out and buried him. Very unusual. 
Well, after an interval about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And we just want Peter, ignore her, let her alone. Don't. This is going to go badly. But Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young man came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. And who wouldn't be fearful because, fearful because I know in my heart that I deserve that and worse. Right? When the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart, if, if you are a Christian, there is no conceivable way that you will try to, to, that in your mind you could ever protest the truth that we all alike stand guilty before God. And we're just as bad as Ananias and Sapphira, and we deserve the very same. The wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where our hope goes. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Savior. So I don't understand it. It's an ugly picture in a way, or it's scary, but and it scared the early church too. But God used it instead of using it to shrink the church, it grew. Many more came and and the, the whole church, a great holy fear fell upon those who heard it. And the, the church continues to grow here. Now, verse 12, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Sol Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So they're a little bit scared of them. Who know? We don't know there if they're scared of what they heard about Ananias and Sapphira, or if they're scared of the Sadducees and the Jewish leaders that are full-fledged persecuting them right now. So, and we'll find that with St. Paul, or Saul later on is going to be the great persecutor of the church. But they're fearful to join them, but they hold them in high esteem because they saw their love for each other and how they took care of their widows and they took care of one another. More than that, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall upon some of them. So the Holy Spirit was doing these great miracles and, and healings, and it was causing people to wake up and be drawn to it. And that's a, a very powerful way that whether it was speaking in tongues in the different communities that the gospel was preached or here with the miraculous healing signs that people heard the word through that, that they were, and it's always through the word. It's not miracles. It's it. The word works miracles to create faith, but it has to come through the word. It's just these miracles brought people from every corner to come and see and give an open ear to hear the gospel proclaimed. But it had to be proclaimed. So what do we say about Peter? And, the, you know, a lot of churches make much of miraculous signs and whatever that oh, this is how the church has to be in our day and age. I'd say this. God does miracles. He does miracles whenever a, a little bitty baby, he creates a new flesh and gives a, a, the new birth of the Holy Spirit. That's a miracle. A dead sinner has been brought to life in the waters of holy baptism. When the bread and wine on your altar, Jesus joins with his words and gives you not just bread and wine and happy thoughts of a God far away, but gives his very flesh and blood, so that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood as eternal life, John 6 says, that's a miracle. And those are the miracles God has promised uh, for his people. And the preaching of the word's a miracle. You've been born again, First Peter 1 says. It's our, that's our epistle for this week. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable 
through the living and enduring word of God. So God does miracles still today. With, and, and we believe he heals today too. And, and he can certainly do mightier things than we can ever conceive or imagine. But the ones that he's promised and he's pointed our eyes and ears to are if you want to find Jesus and you want the miraculous, find it in the watery word of baptism. Find it where he says, this is my body for you. That's a miracle. So don't despise the, the true miracles Jesus promises, hoping that he'll give you a different kind of a miracle. He can do whatever he wants, but these are the ones he commands for his church. Do this. Take, eat, drink of it, all of you. Do this. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Those are miracles. Don't cheat yourself by looking for for something that in your mind you think is more majestic. And I'd also say God uses the healing talents, no doubt, of, of doctors and nurses. They're such a blessing to us at times like this. We pray God God keep them safely as they as through them God does his healing power, exerts his healing power in our lives. Excuse me. There I'm talking way too much. So Verse 16, so the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So there's a powerful ministry that people are bringing from all over the towns surrounding Jerusalem. And this is just the beginning in the book of Acts. It's going to keep spreading. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. The Sadducees were the party of the high priests and were very in line and tied to the, the Roman government. Kind of, they, they derived their power from going along to get along. So they could continue to maintain their power in the temple and the, in the authority over the spiritual needs of the people there in Jerusalem and Rome if they wouldn't let too much trouble be brewed against the Roman occupation. So the Sadducees, they arrested, they arrested the apostles and put them in the, in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. See, just as the devil is a fallen angel, an angel that despised the place God had for him whenever he, he rebelled against God. The devil's the author of lies. The good angels are ministering, this is Hebrews 1, he, are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So the, the devil's the bad angel and his demons, and the good angels serve God and they help God's people. And so it is here. The angel came in the middle of the night, opened the prison doors, and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. That's the first name for the Christian church in the book of Acts. It's named the way. It's named here the life. Go and um, preach all the words of this life. And then, of course, it's going to, in Antioch, it's going to be called the Christians. That's where it first gets that name. So when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. So they've been sprung from jail by the, the angel. And instead of running away to hide, they go out in the temple. And at, it, at dawn, they're out there preaching and teaching. Now, when the high priest came, those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the doors standing and the guards standing at the doors. So the guards didn't even know. They were just standing guard over what? You know, the, the apostles weren't there anymore. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look. The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them. 
but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So they knew that the people were, were receiving the ministry of the apostles there. And, and they were afraid, as the Sadducees, you know, they made their money by changing currency in the temple. People brought their sacrifices and bought their sacrifices from the Sadducees and their their merchants there. And they changed their money and kind of they, they made money on every little transaction there. But they were afraid of the, the Sadducees were afraid of the people because they were honoring the, the apostles and their ministry and their teaching. So when they brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Kind of the pot calling the kettle. I don't know. That's, you know, who else is what well, we know that our Jesus blood is on us, too, because it's my sins that sent him to the cross. It's my bad words, the bad things I say and do and the good things that I don't do. All those sins are on me. All of those sins are on you. It's just funny to hear them say, how come you're making us guilty of this man's blood? Well, because you are the ones that paid 30 pieces of silver to get him arrested and then handed him over to Pontius Pilate. So they're being a, they're protesting a little too much here. So we told you not to preach in this man's name anymore. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Now, this is always the conflict that the church lives in, never more so than now. We live in an age where our government is, is requesting the church, not requesting, is telling the church, you will not preach, you will not hold services for more than, you're going to stay in your house. And of course, the Christian church, I think at this point, has said, we will honor Caesar in this regard out of love for our neighbor, not because we believe that the government has any right to tell the church what the church can or cannot do. But I think we have to admit that there can be a time, perhaps, that the church has to say, look, if you can keep the weed stores open, if you can keep the the abortion clinics open, if you can keep this and that and every you know, the, out, the liquor stores open and tell the church that we can't preach the gospel, there's going to come, there could come a time when Christians are going to have to say, we ought to obey God rather than man. Right now, for the sake of love for our neighbor, we want this opportunity for the, for, for everything to slow down. It's not going to stop. You know, this it's the spread of this is not going to stop, but we'll allow the the for our hospital sake and our healthcare workers sake for this curve to be flattened and we can manage it maybe piece by piece. But people are going to get sick from this. How long does the church continue to, you know, Jesus said, preach the word in season, out of season, do this. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So there's great potential here for the church to struggle to say we can't allow. Now, let's face it. If the church is going to open up and start preaching the word, we're still going to act in love for our neighbors. First, because the greatest love is to give people Jesus. The body and blood of Christ is not it is not less essential than a liquor store or a weed shop. It's the body and blood of Christ that quickens and enlivens that a man may eat and not die, Jesus said. But for the sake of argument, let's just let's admit this, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? That if you can have 20 people walking through Dollar General that the church can space people out in a church med made for 150 people can put 20 people in there at a time, right? Probably. And we can even wipe down stuff afterwards. That's So 
I think there are good, reasonable accommodations that Christian, the Christian church can make, but it's not a long-term acceptable answer to say the church will not proclaim Jesus or give this, the sacrament until there's a vaccine because there may never be one. So there may be a time where, where God's people, stru we're struggling with this now, right? We're struggling with it now. We must obey God rather than men. That's what Peter said. In, in the end, we want to do everything that is good to work within Caesar's framework for how the church operates. But if the government says to the church, you cannot do the ministry of life that God calls us to do, then the church has to say, we must obey God rather than men. And these are, you know, these are difficult times and things. You know, I think about this even before this, it was going on with the, the whole LGBT stuff, you know, all the uh, lesbian, gay, transgender stuff is those people are very much bullies trying to enforce trying to force themselves into the thought process of religious people. Like it's, you cannot think that way, or you cannot teach your children this way. It's, it's discrimination. It's what, it's what, whatever. And there are times when the church will say, I've got to obey God. Now, at some point I would expect, especially in a place like Illinois, something like that to be considered hate speech. And that's, and, and it can be hateful. I mean, there's, but it's it but whenever you preach the word the right way it's not hateful and that's to call lgbt greed pride all my problems my lies and my whatever all that stuff when the church says you're a sinner repent that's not hateful that's the only loving life giving thing to do and if you've got children that are that are wandering away from God and they've skipped church and you've kept you didn't want to hate them you didn't want to be a hater so you never said anything you're not doing them any favors and you are not loving them right and that's true with LGBT it's true with whatever else we got to obey God not men verse 30 the God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed Peter's grace poking him in the face God raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. So they're, they're squirming. You can tell when they say it, you're trying to make us guilty of this. And Peter says, uh, you killed him by hanging him on a tree. That's very powerful, the language of hanging on a tree in Deuteronomy 21 said uh, th that a man who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Well, that's literally true with Jesus is as true God and true man, he came to bear the curse of God for us he was hung on a tree and and under the curse of god so that we don't have to die under that curse and you can look that up deuteronomy 21 galatians 3 has has the other part of that story galatians 3 verse 13 that he was cursed for us so that we don't have to be under god's judgment god exalted him jesus he's talking about god exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. Sorry about that again. I don't want to get on your nerves. But when it says God exalted Jesus to his own right hand, God the Father did not become incarnate. When God says he exalted Jesus to his right hand, Jesus is not literally sitting on God's, like pinning his arm, sitting on a place in heaven called God's right hand. That means Jesus is the right-hand man, right? For the sake of the Holy Trinity, Jesus exercises all authority in heaven and on earth. That is, he's the right-hand man. He's, for the sake of, of the triune God, Jesus rules all things for the sake of the church. And that's where you want it to be. We want this world, even this broken, scary world, we want it in God's hand. We want it in the hands of Jesus because he loved us enough to die for us. And he rules all things, not for the sake of earthly comfort or money. He rules everything for the sake of his church. God works all things for the good of those who love him. That is to say his church. So Jesus has been exalted to the right hand. Where's that? Oh. Verse 31, 
God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Now, a lot of people are, you know, Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist friends are good at this for, for saying, look, Jesus died. You've got to invite Jesus into your heart. You've got to make, uh, you've got to somehow make that connection with him. He's, he's, you got to take that first step. Notice here in verse 31, it says that God exalted Jesus to his right hand to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance is not some some mystical, magical power that you have within you that now that you just made up your mind, you're going to have in, invite him into your heart. Repentance is a gift and a work of the Holy Spirit. God works that in you. Read this book of Acts. It's mighty how many times throughout that it's God who gives the gift of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. So the fact that I'm able to look at myself and say, look, honestly, everything that I've preached about in this and all the meanness, I'm the worst. There is no one that's worse than I am. Dear God, forgive me. And when we can look in the mirror and say that honestly, that is the Holy Spirit's work. And, and it's a good, blessed thing. Right? You don't want to ignore sin. It doesn't, it doesn't do people good. You might think, well, I don't want to bring them down. We confront sin in ourselves and in others so that we can say, oh, God, forgive me. And then look to the cross of Christ. Jesus came for sinners. Right, He didn't come. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Right? It's not the healthy in Matthew chapter 9. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. Right, So stop pretending you're not sick. Jesus comes to heal sick people. The church is a hospital for sinners, not for people who think they're fine. That was the Pharisees. They thought they were fine. They didn't need Jesus. All right. Verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, the Oedas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census, and drew away some of the people after him, and he too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Gamaliel is a wise man. He's saying, look, uh, you might not want to try to destroy this because you might unwittingly find yourself fighting against God. And maybe Gamaliel was smart enough to, to understand the things that he had seen in the last few days since Easter, right? You think about it, the people that were really in the know, they knew they paid off the soldiers that came back from the tomb. So be that as it may, Gamaliel gives wise counsel is, you don't want to fight against God. Now, we're going to find out later that Gamaliel's prized pupil would, was a man named Saul, who we know is our Apostle Paul, who is Gamaliel, was his instructor. And I've, oh, I can't remember, in, the, in a book by F.F. F. Bruce, he talks about, um, about how one of Gamaliel's protégés or students has was vigorously arguing with him constantly and trying to trying to and I can always imagine that and Bruce talks about this in the book but can always imagine that to the end of his life St Paul kept going back to to Gamaliel and trying to say it really is true Jesus appeared to me you've got to believe you've got please tur turn and believe in him but anyway so here we are in verse 39 so they took his advice, 
And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. All right, sometimes the church suffers. And you know what? That's not bad either. You look at Philippians chapter 1. And it's, I know this is hard to do a Bible study like this, but you think of Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. It says, For it has been given to you, granted to you, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So not only is faith to believe in Jesus something that has been given to you, but also the cross is a gift. Now, it's a gift I want to give back sometimes. None of us enjoys the, the difficulty and the struggles and the hurtful things. But the cross is also a blessing insofar as it keeps me from becoming so full of myself that I wander away from God and my salvation in him. So they rejoice they're counted worthy to suffer dishonor for Jesus' name. How many of us can say that? How many of us can say honestly that that we rejoice whenever people make fun of us? You know, we have young kids that that go to high school classes that where they're force fed evolution, that you're no different. You just you evolved out of the primordial ooze. You're no different than any other organ living organism. All that junk that's taught as fact. And it's fairy tale. And and for our Christian young people that have to say, you know what, I might, I, I got to pass this class fine, but I'm not letting you overrule with your fairy tales, overrule the word of God. There's a persecution involved in that. There's a persecution involved as a young person or an old person, right, who is is willing to say, I'm not going to accept shacking up or I'm not going to accept all, all of the the drunkenness. I'm not going to go out and, and close every bar with all my buddies. I'm not going to accept that and pretend it's okay. It's not okay. And and if it causes me to not be invited to the party or it causes me not to be accepted or not to be embraced by somebody, well, then we count it joy to suffer for the sake of his name. And it says, last verse, and, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Right. So every day in the temple and from house to house. So the temple was, was prominently where they met to proclaim the gospel and share the good news of Christ. But probably their services of the sacrament, which were part of their, a, a, a regular part of their life together in Acts chapter 2, was the reading of the word the breaking of bread, the sacrament, and prayers. That was worship. And that part of it, the body and blood of Christ, the, the Lord's Supper and the preaching of the word, would probably happen around house altars and, and homes until the church got got too big and, and then finally was became a you know, mainstream and, and really became the religion of the empire after 313. But here it's from the temple and house to house. Now we are house to house. This is what we are. You're hearing the word, this in your home. God be praised for that. And the Holy Spirit uses it. And this is a gift of technology that no other generation has had. And, and we can be thankful for that. But we also know something's missing. Right? The Jesus who said, this is my body, will gather his church again to give his holy life, giving body and blood at his altar and we should recognize that because what we don't want to happen is for the church like a flock that the devil scatters so that at the end of this, when we can all come back together again, people say, well, you know, I can just watch church on TV. It's that's it's just as good. No, it's not. This is an accommodation to a tough time. But the Bible says, do not forsake assembling together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as you see the day approaching. See, God wants us together to encourage each other. Hebrews 10, 25. That's, that is the third commandment. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. 
Well, you got to do that in your home now. I encourage you to continue. Turn off the TV. It just all it's going to do is is ruin your day and make you cynical, probably. But be fed with the word of God and lift up your voice in prayer. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word of life. Strengthen and preserve us always in this gift and continue to gather your flock from all corners of the world. Make us ready, dear Jesus, for the day you come. Amen. Now, let me say, finally, these things that we're living through give every impression of being the last days. God knows I don't. But repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't live for this world. Don't live for the things of this world that are all fading and failing. And this time has taught us. But your Lord Jesus loves you and has won your heavenly home. In, in your father's house are many rooms. Jesus went there to prepare a place for you. Put your faith and hope in him and be saved eternally. Amen.